So, um, so I guess, should I? Well, let me just give you the answer to part A so that you can, if you're answering it for yourself, you can at least check your answer. So I have this ballistic pendulum being described. This is a reached rod. So it says that this mass will come in, strike, and then it says become stuck to it. And that's a, a key phrase because becoming stuck to it, it describes a completely inelastic collision. So uh, when you ans are answering part A, for total mechanical energy, you should say it's not conserved because the collision that you are seeing as it is described is a completely inelastic collision. And uh, when you look at the total linear momentum, this should be conserved. And total angular momentum, it's also conserved. And both of them are conserved for same or similar reason. Total linear momentum is conserved because net external force is equal to zero. Uh, when you look at this collision process through the free body diagram of these two masses, um, by the way, I am going to say gravity is negligible. Um, it, because, um, well, um, I'm kind of looking at the short duration and the impact force will be much greater than gravity. So I'm gonna say gravity is negligible. That also make this tension force negligible. So really the only two forces you have are force of interaction between these two masses. Um, oops, they should have been the same length because these are action reaction force pairs. So they will have an equal magnitude opposite directions. Um, so that external force is zero. Um, yeah, I think it, depending on how it's uh, set up, there's a, a chance for some pivot force to be involved there. Uh, I, I think uh, the way it's set up here, it, it, the pivot force should not come into play. <laughs> and um, that would be a complication that you wouldn't have to worry about. Um, and the total angular momentum, it's also conserved because net external torque is equal to zero. Um, the only forces that could have been applying torque here would be either um, some sort of frictional force that's involved at the pivot. And I think, do I say frictionless pivot? Uh, I think really much. Uh, well, I don't say frictionless, but we're gonna assume it's frictionless and um, so, total angular momentum is conserved too. So those should be answers to part A, once again, which covers topics that we don't really cover, um, cover for our exam three. So um, the material that's more relevant for our exam three is uh, what I'm asking in B and uh, C and D, which is basically asking you to remember what you remember about oscillations. So it's saying that, uh, so uh, let me just draw the picture here so that I don't have to keep uh, moving back and forth. So after collision, what you basically have is a combined mass of M plus M that has some initial velocity V naught. And it's saying, assume that this is small enough that the subsequent motion can be approximated as a simple harmonic oscillator motion. And it's actually saying two things. One, it's saying that this is small enough that this is not going to go all the way, all the way around. Like if you did that, then it won't, wouldn't even be simple pendulum. It's saying that this is small enough that this is going to swing back and forth like a pendulum motion. And it's actually saying a second thing about how it can be approximated as a simple harmonic oscillator motion. If you remember the thing about pendulum being an example of a, uh, something that's not necessarily a simple harmonic oscillator, it's also saying that this amplitude, so when it gets to the maximum displacement, that this angle is going to be small enough that we can treat this as, we can use a small angle approximation and treat this as simple harmonic oscillator. So it says calculate in terms of given quantities in symbols, angular frequency of oscillation and amplitude of oscillation. 
Well, angular frequency, you're not actually calculating that you're just uh, recalling, uh, uh, memorize the formula, which is angular frequency of a pendulum is given by square root of gravitational acceleration g divided by L. So that's it. You remember the formula or have the formula written down in your formula card and write it down. That's kind of all that you need. Um, you do need to calculate amplitude of oscillation. And for that, the thing to do would be to use uh, conservation of energy. So you are given this position here where you are starting out with um, initial angle V0 and in initial speed of V0, and you want to describe, um, uh, you want to describe the highest point here, which will be giving you the amplitude of oscillation, theta max. And one principle you can use to take you from this snapshot one to snapshot two is conservation of energy. So you say whatever kinetic energy you have at this point goes into the potential energy at point two. So let me write that down. Uh, so this is the and total energy at snapshot one. So kinetic energy at point one plus potential energy at point one is equal to snapshot for point two. And uh, as a matter of good practice, good habit, let me just write down all the terms. Kinetic energy at point two plus potential energy at point two. So kinetic energy at point two is going to be zero. That's the maximum height. That's where uh, velocity is equal to zero. Now potential energy at point one, we can always do this. We can say this represents my y equal to zero. So this put a position where the distance of the mass from the pivot point is L, I'm gonna call that my zero point. That reference point will make expression for my potential energy equal to zero at that point. So what I have is then a way to say, all right, my kinetic energy down at that point, one half uh, mass times the initial velocity squared is equal to potential energy at point two. And what I need to figure out is this the difference in height. And uh, let me draw a new figure for that. So let's see, here's my L. Now at that maximum height, this uh, distance is still L, it's the same rod. So um, this is the right triangle that I have to draw. Um, so this is my theta max and um, this is a difference in height. What it's going to be is, um, let me, uh, I don't know, let me just use capital X. This difference in height is going to be L minus, um, minus what I'm labeling as capital X here. This uh, side of the triangle minus capital X. So um, from this right triangle, you see that uh, capital X is L cosine theta. Um, so put that in here, um, L minus L uh, cosine, uh, L cosine theta or um, L times one minus cosine theta. Um, so putting that into the expression for gravitational potential energy on the right hand side, it's gonna be mass times G times the change in height, which will be L times one minus cosine. And this theta is the theta max or the amplitude of oscillation. And um, the rest is going through, rest of this question is going through this algebra and solving it for theta max you see some things that simplify and you might um, find in the end, write down theta max in terms of arc cosine of uh, some quantity that you're gonna work out algebraically. That's a fine answer, that's fine. There's another way to answer this. Um, 
it, especially if you feel comfortable with small angular approximation. So since we are using this small angular approximation anyway, you could say, all right, so let's say um, I can use small angular approximation to rewrite this cosine of theta max. Now, what you do have to be careful with is, um, so if, if you say this is approximately equal to one, you'll get zero and you won't get an expression that involves theta max. So what you have to be careful with is you have to be careful to go the next step in the small angle approximation. And that's why I'm saying uh, you should feel comfortable with this. The next uh, term in the Taylor expansion is minus theta uh, squared divided by two factorial. So, um, so I can approximate this cosine of theta max as one minus theta max squared over two. You see the ones cancel out, minus cancels out minus, and I get uh, this uh, parenthesis term to be just the theta max squared over two. And that's where you can relate theta max um, directly to all the other terms just algebraically without having to go through a trig function. Either approach is fine. I think at this point um, in this class, you are not uh, expected to be super familiar with the Taylor expansion. So um, if you would rather do this exact expression for theta max, which isn't wrong, then that's fine. I guess that's better than um, using just the, the leading term and then not getting an answer. So, uh, so so that's why I present this first. But for those advanced people who have taken math 3B and feel some level of familiarity with um, Taylor polynomial, then this is the approach that I would encourage you to consider. Um, so get that you get an expression for amplitude of oscillation that you can uh, relate to other quantities like angular frequency of oscillation and all that good stuff. Okay, continuing part C. Um, it's uh, asking what is the angle theta, and let me just expand this a little bit. Uh, all right, I'm gonna have to fix this later. Um, what is the angle theta that the uh, massless rod makes uh, with the vertical as a function of time, given the initial condition, give an expression for theta of t. Um, so, yeah, and let the angular to be positive and then negative. Okay. So this is um, a question that's basically asking you to recall this um, this expression for oscillation that you might have seen. Um, as an example, the oscillation of a mass on a spring uh, representing the position of the mass. Uh, this is kind of. Um, 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 kind of a template that you can fit all these mathematical forms into. Amplitude times cosine of omega t uh, minus phase factor phi. So this is an expression that you saw somewhere, somehow. Um, and what you are asked to do in this question is basically apply this to this setup. So you are looking at theta of t. So let's, I guess, write that down. So theta is a function of time. And the amplitude, I could just use the ampl expression for amplitude that I wrote down here. So I'll just use that. Um, so theta max times cosine of omega, angular frequency. I know that from above. So that's going to be square root of g over L times time minus the phase factor. So really the biggest portion of uh, doing this question comes down to figuring out this phase factor. And one way you can do that is you can just plug this in. You plug in t equals zero, then you get cosine of minus phi is equal to um, um, uh, well, theta is equal to zero. So, um, so this is the expression you uh, come down to. Cosine of phi is equal to zero. 
it's a, a question of, okay, what value of phi works? You have different possibilities. So phi equals zero doesn't work. That gives me cosine of zero is one. So phi has to be, it could be pi over two. It could be three pi over two. And then after that, it actually just repeat. So uh, it's a matter of which of these are right. Um, if I imagine phi equals pi over two, then this is what I have. Um, I, it, it's kind of easier to visualize this with a phase or diagram. So I'm looking at cosine of something that's starting out at pi over two, and then, oh wait, um, I put minus sign. Let me put in plus um, so that this, uh, you know, minus plus uh, doesn't really matter in the end. <laughs> um, um, so um, the way I'm drawing here, it works with the plus sign there. So I'm starting with a cosine of um, plus pi over two at time equals zero, and later time this is increasing. So I see that as this is increasing, my cosine of this whole thing is becoming more negative, and uh, that doesn't quite jive with this statement here. The pendulum starts out by swinging to the right. So I want it to be initially starting out with a positive value. So what I really want is three pi over two so that my phaser or something that represents what, which part of the cycle of oscillation I am on starts out from down here. Uh, that's three pi over two. So that as time increases, my cosine becomes positive. So, um, so this is, would be one answer. Uh, theta of t is equal to theta max, which can be expressed in terms of these. So, um, so let me just write down theta max times cosine of square root of g over l times t plus three pi over two. And as far as the answer goes, this is not a wrong answer. Here's a one way to get to this uh, a little bit more quickly. Um, you might remember two, basically two different ways of representing oscillation. Um, here's this expression, which I actually do prefer, but when you're talking about trigonometric functions, there's cosine and there's a sine. So you could be using sine to, um, to represent this, sine of omega t plus phi. So when you go through the same set of steps, uh, starting out with this as the template, then you get phi is equal to zero. And as time increases, you get positive displacement. So with that, one way you can write this out is theta of t as theta max times the sine of square root of g over l times t. And um, you can actually show that these two expressions are equivalent to each other by using the, the angle addition formula. So if we use the cosine addition formula, which as a reminder is cosine of alpha plus minus beta is equal to cosine of alpha cosine of beta minus plus the sine of alpha sine of beta you will see that um, um, you will see that um, plugging in this expression through the cosine angle addition formula that you end up with this expression. So both are valid, correct, um, correct answers, and you can show that they are equivalent. So this question just asking you to recall that, and the more familiarity we have, you have with the mathematical representation of oscillation the more quickly you can answer this. Um, so it took me like five, six, seven minutes to explain it, but you could have answered it in like one minute.